Storytellers from the world, welcome to our podcast, La Machine à Écrire, which in English would translate to The Typewriter. As you might have guessed from our beautiful accent, this is a French podcast dedicated to storytelling. This episode, however, will be conducted fully in English as our guest today is the famous American author, script doctor, and teacher, John Truby. Indeed, John is the author of the seminal book Anatomy of Story and a brand new book, Anatomy of Genres. In nearly 30 years, John Truby has trained more than 50,000 writers, producers, and directors around the world and has worked on more than a thousand scripts for major studios such as Disney, Sony Pictures, HBO, and the BBC. But don't be alarmed, he will do most of the talking. In this conversation, we will talk about genres, you know, such as action, science fiction, fantasy, comedy, and many more. In particular, we're going to talk about their themes and the different tools for writing good stories in the different genres and the way to transcend them to reach the top 1% of popular writers. I am Yannick Lejeune. And I am Mike Cessno. It's time for a masterclass you won't forget. <laughs> It's a little tradition of us at the beginning. We love to start our show by asking our guest the ultimate question. What makes a good story? <laughs> um, so today we're talking to one of the most renowned experts on the matter. So John, according to you, what makes a good story? Well, that is the $64 million dollar question. And I love the fact that just starting with that. And for me to try to boil that down to a recognizable answer that makes sense, you have to start off by saying the good story is structured. And this is a big term that has caused a lot of confusion for writers. And so let me say right off the bat that I'm not talking about fake structure. And in that category, I would put things like three act or hero's journey or save the cat. Or the something that's become very popular recently, which is collecting tropes, using tropes in the story. Or beat sheets with beat sheets that don't even exist, like this concept of the midpoint. Completely fake. Completely fake. No, I believe that a good story is based on deep structure, which is how the main character evolves by going after a goal and encountering opposition. And that leads to what I think is the single most important technique of good storytelling, which is that plot must come from character. Now, there are a lot of techniques for doing that, but in my opinion, that is the essence of good story. A lot of our listeners have read your book, Anatomy of Story. It's a famous book. Many of our guests have mentioned it on the show before, and many have attended your masterclass in Paris. So what got you started on writing Anatomy of Genres? Well, it's an interesting evolution because when I first started writing The Anatomy of Story, my intention was to include all the professional techniques a writer would need in order to write a best-selling novel or a screenplay that sells. But The one subject that it doesn't cover, which is now the key to writing a hit film or novel, is how to write the different genres that make up 99% of popular story today. If you want to succeed as a professional writer, you have to write stories that the business, and by that I mean the studios, the publishers, and of course, especially the readers, want to buy, which means mastering the structure of the genres that you write. And that in turn means, first of all, mastering the 15 to 20 plot beats that are unique to each story form. Because if you don't know those beats, and if you don't hit every one of them, you have no chance of getting to the top. Because popular storytelling today is such that if you want to be successful, it means you have to get to the top 1% of writers in the world. Those are the people who have a story brand. Those are the people who sell and resell their work, who work as professionals. And my real passion for the last five to 10 years has been, how do I help writers get into that top 1%? In your book, you break down everything storytellers have to understand about the 14 most popular genres, such as horror, action, Uh, fantasy, science fiction, crime, detective, comedy, 
love stories and many more. Before we dive in, can you tell us what are your favorite two genres and why you love them? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, my favorite two genres uh, are probably the Western and the gangster story. And it very much has to do with my personal background, which is that growing up when I was a kid, many, many years ago, and I won't tell you how long ago that is, the Western was all over television. Half the shows in television were Westerns. And what's interesting about the Western, even though it's very much focused toward the United States, it's a much bigger subject than that. The Western is about the rise and fall of civilization. In particular, it's about the rise of the American dream. So it's a very hopeful form. It's really how do you create a nation and how does each individual, you know, seeking their own place in the world, how do they help build that nation? And so it's a very positive, can-do genre. The reason it became so popular to me was when it turned into the anti-Western. If the Western is about the rise of civilization, the anti-Western is about the fall of civilization. And the anti-Western is where the Western becomes an art form. Before that, it becomes a creed. With the anti-Western, it becomes an art form. It raises its level. In fact, in the period from about eight, uh, 1968 to 1971, you had four great anti-Westerns. And there has never been that kind of spurt of greatness and creativity in a genre in history of story. So those were The Wild Bunch, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Once Upon a Time in the West, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. And those films not only showed me a much more realistic picture about the making of my country, they showed a picture of how civilization can rise and fall that it's kind of a cautionary tale. And what about Gangster? Now, interesting thing about Gangster is Gangster is a direct outgrowth of the Western. If classic Western is about the rise of the American dream, the Gangster story is about the fall of the American dream. It's about the corruption of the American dream. And in this way, it really shows if the Western is about really 19th century, the Gangster story is about the 20th century, and about the way we live now. It's a very accurate picture about the way we live now. In the book, I talk about the importance of transcending genres. In other words, don't just do the genre the way everybody else is doing it. You've got to jump it to another level so that you really stand out from the crowd. Can you tell us more about the three ways to transcend a genre that uh, you are stating in your book? Sure. In the book, I talk about there's, there's three rules in terms of being successful as a popular storyteller today. The first is you have to write in the genre world because it is a genre world. The second is that you need to mix genres in your story. You need to have anywhere from two to four genres for it to be a successful story. But the third rule is that if you want to be successful, you have to transcend the four. And there's three ways you do that. First of all, you twist the beats. In other words, instead of hitting the plot beats the way they are normally done, you do them in a unique way. You flip them in some unique way. Let me give you some examples of this from, from Avatar, for example. Avatar is a very interesting story because it tracks going from a male myth to a female myth. So, for example, in myth stories, one of the main beats is the talisman. Talisman is an object of power or significance that identifies the hero. Well, in a typical male myth story, which is what we almost always see, that talisman is something like a sword. In Avatar, it's a female myth talisman. It's the seed of the sacred tree. Also in that story, birth of the hero is one of the basic beats of a myth story. Well, in Avatar, they do the rebirth of the hero, and we see him as he takes on his Navi body. That's the first way that you do it. You twist the beats. The second way you do it is that each genre expresses a life philosophy through the theme. And this is the true power of genre storytelling. Most writers know that genres are plot systems. What they don't know is that they're also theme systems. These themes are extremely powerful and they're expressed under the surface which is crucially important because most writers are afraid 
of theme. They don't want to be what we call on the nose. They don't want to be obvious. They don't want to preach to the audience. And what genres allow you to do is to express that deeper life philosophy of that particular genre through the story structure, through the plot beats, so that instead of hitting the audience in the head, they open up and allow that theme to come in. And that's why they really watch those particular genres, the ones that they love. Now, the third way that you transcend the genre is you explore the deeper life story that's embedded in that genre form. Can you give us some examples of what you mean by that? Absolutely. The deeper life story that horror stories explore is religion. For action, it's success. Myth, it's the life process. Memoir and coming-of-age stories are about creating the self. Science fiction, very big picture. It's about science, society, and culture. Crime is really the deepest level about morality and justice. Comedy is about manners and morals. Western, as I mentioned, it's the rise and fall of civilization. Gangster is really about the corruption of business and politics. Fantasy is about the art of living. Detective stories and thrillers are about the mind and the truth. And love is about the art of happiness. If you can use all three of these techniques to transcend your form, you will be writing in very rarefied atmosphere. You will be alone on the mountaintop because virtually no one is hitting storytelling at that level right now. About what you just said about Avatar mixing a lot of genres and the way that combining three or four genres is the way to transcend the genre. In your book, you explain that Star Wars was the first movie to mix several genres. This contributed to its global cultural impact worldwide. Since then, studios and writers have learned to mix genres, as you explained, in their stories. In your opinion, are all genres mixable together, or are there some genres that are yet to be successfully mixed together? Theoretically, all genres are mixable, but there is no question that certain genres combine well and others do not. And it has to do with the genre spectrum. Basically, genres are on a spectrum from total action to total mind. So on one extreme, we would have detective stories, total mind. On the other hand, we would have the action form, total action. Now, certain forms you would think would not mix well, but that is one of the tricks to transcending the form, which is not only do we want to twist the individual beats of the form, we want to mix genres that are not normally combined. So for example, Men in Black was very popular because it combined science fiction and comedy. Very rare. Inception, very popular because it combined science fiction and heist story. These never go together. And yet the writer was able to figure out how to do that. And because it was so unique, people hadn't seen it before. They went, wow, I love this. So it's one of the key strategies that you want to try to find two or three genres that you can combine that have not been combined before. Now, here's the problem. The reason they haven't been combined in the past is that structurally they are on opposite ends of the spectrum. In other words, the way they hit each of their beats is in certain ways fundamentally opposite from the other genre. And so it's very hard to put them in the same story because when writers try to mix genres, if they don't know what they're doing, they end up with story chaos. You have to understand how to combine these genres, especially genres that don't normally go together. And the most important technique for doing that is whatever genres you're going to combine, choose one genre to be the primary form. Because you were talking about a hierarchy of genres, that's a subject that we were very interested in. Yes. You say that, you know, that the love is the ultimate genre. And uh, we were wondering uh, why you think there is a hierarchy of genres. This was the biggest revelation for me in writing the book, that if you sequence the genres in a certain way, you get what I call a ladder of enlightenment. What do I say that? Each genre has tremendous wisdom that they express through the theme. However, certain genres are very primal. Others are express elements of what it means to be human at the highest level. For example, at the very beginning, the lowest rung of the ladder is the horror story. Now, 
that's partly because it is the least appreciated. It is the most looked down on of all the genres, but it doesn't have to be. Horror stories done at a very high level are extremely powerful and have great thematic force, but it is the most primal. It's about how do we confront our own death and how do we make amends for the sins that we have committed in our lives? So this is why it gives us the ground level on which the other genres build. Now, the first genre on the strictly human level is action, because it is the most basic question of human life, which is you have to act to live. And the action story is about success. How do you live successfully? Meaning it's where we're closest to the animals in terms of it's all about win or lose. There is no mercy in the action form. It's about, do I defeat him? And so as we move up these different genre steps, the next beat up of the ladder is the myth story, which is about the life process, about seeing your life as an entire process so that you can see what is the life I want to live that will allow me to experience my true destiny. After that, you get memoir and coming of age, which is about creating the self. Right. And then I go through the various genres that deal with the individual's relation to society, things like science fiction, crime, comedy, Western, gangster. And then as you rise to the very highest levels, first of all, you have fantasy, which, as I mentioned, is about the art of living, the art of living well, the art of living with spontaneity and freedom. Then you have detective, which is about the mind and the truth, arguably the first and final frontier, the frontier of the mind. And finally, you have love, the art of happiness, because love gives us the recipe for day-to-day -day living, day-to-day -day success in our lives, and we do it through love. This is why there is a ladder of enlightenment in the genres and also why I think that the book should be read in that sequence. Now, having said that, I suspect that most people will read the book parts in terms of reading the genres that most apply to the stories that they write. But there is a real benefit to reading this genres in terms of if you're looking for more than just techniques for how to write good stories in terms of how to live, reading them in that sequence is very powerful. This ladder of enlightenment that you've just mentioned and the, this uh, hierarchy of genres, is this why our liking of certain genres can change as we grow older? Because our own personal concerns and our inner questions in life are evolving as we grow older from childhood to adulthood towards the final rolling credits. Absolutely right. It's one of the exercises that I recommend that writers do in terms of digging into their own lives, the story of their own lives, which can then inform the stories they write, is to look at the genres of your life. What have been the most important genres of your life in terms of the set of values that you believe in and by which you want to live? And so to take my own case, as a kid, I started off living a story form of Western and action story. This is what inspired me. But as I grew older, I left those behind. And I mentioned when I was in my late teens and in college, I was, you know, very much affected by the power of the anti-Western, which is the opposite set of themes and values of the Western. And then the area of crime, morality and justice became much more of a concern to me in my life. I think that in the last half of my life, I've tried to really focus on detective and love. These are the genres and the set of values that really infuse my life and that I try to make my life all about. And so having an understanding of these deeper life philosophies and genres can make a huge difference in your own life in terms of the life that you want to lead going forward. Let's go through some of the genres that we have talked about. And you told us that horror was linked to escaping or sins. Um, is that why you say in your books that Adam and Eve is the first horror story? Horror stories are about confronting death and dealing with the sins that we have committed in our lives. And horror, then, is perfectly expressed in the Adam and Eve story. Interestingly enough, Adam and Eve is the first horror story, and the story of Cain and Abel, their sons, the first crime story. So with Adam and Eve, we have the heroes, Adam and Eve, going up against the first opponent, who is the monster, 
who is in the form of the snake. What's interesting about Adam and Eve is that while it is an extremely old story, and in many ways the first horror story, it is also quite modern. Because if you look in the book, I talk about transcending horror, and that the key story for transcending horror is Frankenstein. And there are many reasons for that, but one of them is that it uses what I consider the single most important technique for transcending horror, which is that over the course of the story, the hero becomes the monster, and the monster becomes the hero. So the character that we thought was monstrous, was terrifying, was horrifying, turns out to be the most human of all, and the character we thought was our hero turns out to be an animal who reacts violently against what does not look like him. And so the most interesting thing in terms of story structure from Adam and Eve is that while the first monster and the obvious monster is the snake who tempts them, the real opponent in this story is the father, because the father is the one who, in retaliation for their mistake, forces them to go from a utopian life that is forever and cast them out into a living hell and a life where there is death at the end. That becomes the true opponent and a much deeper human opponent. The Bible is so full of great storytelling. And when you look at these different stories in terms of different genres, it's very, very illuminating in terms of how way ahead of its time it is in terms of its ability to tell stories that can affect millions of people over thousands of years. Let's move to action. Can you tell us more about the four-point opposition technique that you use to prevent a simplistic opposition between two characters? Four-point opposition, in my opinion, is one of the easily 10 most important techniques in story. Why is that? It's because the biggest challenge that writers have in popular story today, in every medium, is having enough plot. Plot has more techniques that go into it than all of the other major writing skills combined. And frankly, most writers do not know anywhere near all the techniques of plot that they need to know in order to write a professional level plot that can have worldwide effect. There are many, many techniques to plot, but certainly one of the most important is the four-point opposition. And what I mean by the four-point opposition is that there are different ways to do it. But the typical way that you do it, certainly in a feature film, is you have a single hero, you have one main opponent, and then you have at least two secondary opponents. Now, what that means is that instead of going with a two-point opposition, that is just having the hero fighting a single main opponent, which only gives you a single conflict, with four-point opposition, you immediately have multiple conflicts happening throughout the story which means that the amount of plot density increases exponentially. And so you not only have the hero versus the main opponent, the hero is also fighting the second opponent and the third opponent. And we can even get opposition between the different opponents. It allows us to have attacks against the hero coming at a much faster rate. And this gets to what I consider probably the biggest misunderstanding of story that exists in the entire world of writers, which is they don't understand what plot really is. What most writers think that plot is, they think that plot is the sequence of actions that the hero takes to try to get the goal. And in the process of going after that goal, they're run up against different opposition. Well, that's how the reader experiences the plot. But that's not how the writer creates the plot. The key to creating plot is to realize that plot is the master plan that the main opponent and the author use to put the hero in the greatest possible trouble. If you think about plot from the point of view of the opponent, it immediately becomes much easier to figure out because you realize what I'm doing here is sequencing a number of attacks that the opponent is going to use to defeat the hero from getting his goal. This gets to the biggest problem that writers have in creating plot is they think that it's just a series of unconnected obstacles that the hero has to overcome. No, it's a sequence. It's an entire campaign that the opponent is doing 
that the hero has to overcome. This is also why you need to know the endpoint of your plot before you begin writing the story. This is the, 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 one of those basic requirements there is that many people fight against. But this idea that plot is the opponent's scheme means everything falls into place for you, which is why one of the techniques that I talk about in the detective story, which has maybe the trickiest use of opponent in any story form, is when you're coming up with the plot, always begin with the opponent's plan because that will determine everything to come after that. Let's move, if you're okay with that, to another genre, one that I really love myself. That's myth. Here's a fun fact for you. In French, we use the same word for genre and gender. In your book, you explain that some genres are to be written slightly differently according to the gender of the hero. Uh, for example, what differentiates, according to you, a male myth from a female myth, the one you mentioned when we talked about Avatar? Well, you, you've put your finger on one of the two major revolutions in story that we have all lived through just in the last 20 years. The first major revolution in story, and this I put at the level of the rise of the novel in the mid-1700s and the rise of film in the early 1900s. The first of these revolutions is the rise of television as an art form. The second is the reemergence of the female myth. Now, female myth has been gone from Western culture for over 3,000 years. But just in the last 10 years, it's come back and it's coming back strong. So in the myth chapter, I talk about the difference between male myth and female. And I point out that, in my opinion, female myth will be a major form of worldwide story for the next few decades. So one of the reasons it's difficult for writers to understand the idea of a female myth is that because we've been experiencing the male myth for 3,000 years, the perception has grown up that that's the only way of writing myth or writing story that we have. And this comes from Joseph Campbell's idea of the monomyth. He's one of the great figures in the history of story, but on that, I disagree with him strongly. In fact, the beats of the myth story, the monomyth that he talks about, are really the beats of a male warrior myth. So what are these other ways of telling the story, most especially the female myth? Well, you begin with the different source of these two myth forms. Male myth comes from the hunt, where we have essentially a single goal. It's very much a linear storyline as the characters, the heroes, try to catch the animal and win the game of the hunt. Well, female myth is all about the seasons. It's all about crops. It's all about the cycle of life. And so we get a fundamental difference in terms of how that story form plays out. So male myth is very much a linear story form, whereas female myth is similar to the life of you know plants. It's all about we get birth, we get rise to maturity, we get slow decline, then death, then rebirth, resurrection, and life begins again. So what you see there is, first of all, two very different forms of immortality. And that is the deepest theme of myth, is how do you gain immortality in this life? The simplest way I find to distinguish the two of them, without going into the, the separate beats of each one, is that male myth is about divide and conquer. Female myth is about combine and grow. And you can see those are fundamentally different approaches to how to live. They're also fundamentally different approaches to how to tell a story, especially focused on conflict. Because we have been in this male warrior myth form of storytelling for 3,000 years, there has arisen the idea, we all know it, we've all heard it a hundred times, that we want more conflict. Conflict equals drama. And that gets its expression in the end of the male myth story where you get the final battle. And it's a big physical battle. It's violent and a lot of people die. Whereas female myth is not about that. Female myth is about how do you avoid conflict? How do you come up with a solution that doesn't require us to kill each other? And I would argue that that is thematically a much healthier way for the world to live with the way the world is structured now going forward. But then you can see, as a writer, you can see the challenge you have. How do I tell a story with less conflict? Very tough to do. 
But if you look at some of the films that are female myth stories that have just come out in the last few years, things like Avatar, which moves from male myth to female myth, uh, you have stories like Gravity, stories like Arrival. These are stories where you have a female main character figuring out how to solve the problem on the journey without resorting to conflict. Speaking of uh, Joseph Campbell, can you tell us about the uh, differences between the hero's journey and the coming of age stories? Well, we talked about that genre spectrum. In certain ways, myth and coming of age story are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Myth is about, you know, superheroes and super monsters and fantastical journeys and so on and so forth. The memoir and coming of age story are very much smaller. They're very personal. They're very much focused on a particular moment of somebody's life. And they're not fantastical. They're very much the expression of the drama form, which is typically about conflict between intimate opponents, conflict between characters who are within a family. So in that sense, it appears that these are totally opposites in the way that they work. But in fact, myth and coming of age are both, in a larger sense, about creating the self. Myth does it with big picture. Coming of age does it with small picture. Now, coming of age is the term that we use in English for a story form that started in Europe, especially in Germany, known as the Bildungsroman, which is a specifically defined as a story of formation. How did the character become who they are? And it typically focuses on a specific moment of that person's life. And it, uh, certainly in terms of American storytelling, that moment is usually when they are a teenager becoming a young adult. But one of the key points about coming of age is it doesn't have to be that. It is the moment when the character goes through a major character change. And from then on, that's who they are in essence. That really defines who they are and where they found who they are in essence. And now they can live that life. In that sense, coming of age is very much more personal. It involves Again, conflict with members of the family. We see this in recent coming of age film like Coda. But at the climax of that story, that the self revelation of the character, the character has really, in a in a very real sense, gotten to the deepest sense of who they are as a person, and that will blast with them forevermore. Earlier, we talked about uh, Adam and Eve being the first horror story. And you mentioned some other uh, great old stories from the Bible. I would like to talk about Shakespeare and the Tempest that you mention in your book. Why do you think it is both the first science fiction story and the first Western story? Science fiction is about creating society, and it's about the individual's place within that society. Will that society be a world of freedom or a world of slavery? And it typically emphasizes the use of technology to create that society, and in some cases, to enslave the hero. Now, in the case of The Tempest, what is the, quote, technology that is found in that story? It is the technology of magic. Just because we normally think of magic and technology as opposites doesn't mean they are. No, magic in story terms is a form of technology. I also mentioned that The Tempest is unique in the sense that, in many ways, it's the first Western. Uh, because it tracks the movement of Europe to America, leaving a place where status and rank and privilege and class determines one's position and life to going to a completely clean slate, one that's very much, you know, dominated by nature, and then creating your own kingdom within that world. So in that sense, it's both science fiction and Western. One other point about science fiction, one of the key techniques of science fiction is the island. The island is the laboratory of man. This is where the writer puts a group of people, and then we create a different society for how to live. We see this in Lord of the Flies, and we see it most recently in Triangle of Sadness, where we put these characters on an island. And then we check to see what is the new social form, social ranking, and form of government by which this society is operating. And of course, in Triangle of Sadness, we take the person who was 
at the lowest level on the boat. You know, she cleans the toilets. And on the island, she is now number one. She's the captain. And the men, the rich men who before were at number in the number one position, are now at the bottom. Let's switch to comedy. Mike attended your course in Paris and uh, he learned a lot about that. Can we speak about the three kinds of uh, Bergson comic drop? Absolutely. It underlies everything in the comic form, both in the joke, all the way up through the scene, all the way up through the entire story. Bergson's insight was that in comedy, in a joke, what causes laughter comes in three forms, and it's based on the fact that the character is dropped. And they may be literally dropped, but they are dropped in status or they're embarrassed. They go from a position of being pompous and arrogant to being shown, you know, what their true self is, which is much lower. And this moment of drop is what causes us to laugh. His point was that there are three major forms of how this happens to an animal, a child, or a machine. Now, in animal humor, it's basically where we show a character doing the same bodily functions that animals do, which is why bathroom humor and sex humor are always animal comedy. Child comedy is where we show a character dropped to the level of a child. And we do that either by showing them literally acting like a child, but more generally, it happens whenever we see a character act with more emotion than the situation demands. So they might cry. They might throw a temper tantrum. Uh, they might pull their hair and scream. The machine drop, which is the opposite of child comedy, is where the character either acts like an object or a machine, literally, or they react to a situation with less emotion than the situation requires. And that's why it's a very droll, a very dry comedy. It's what we call in the U.S., we call deadpan humor. It's a very dead, uninflected way of speaking. When you look at either an individual action in a story or when you're trying to do a joke in a story, always be very clear exactly how is this person being dropped. Because if the character is not being dropped and not being dropped in one of these three main ways, it won't be funny. It's that simple. It's almost scientific in the way that it works. Every year on Facebook, you write your notorious reviews of Oscar-nominated movie that you call Countdown to the Oscars. And we, with Yannick, we really love to read them every time you post them. This year, you wrote one about Avatar, The Way of Water, that we've mentioned earlier. And once again, it was a massive popular success from James Cameron. But you rated the movie very, very well, even though you criticized the script quite a lot. Can you explain to us why? It was very similar to the response that I had to Top Gun Maverick. These are both examples of action stories, although they are also mixed genre stories. And Avatar and James Cameron, in almost everything that he does, combines three genres. Those are myth, action, and love story. That combination is probably the most popular combination of mixed genre in worldwide story today. And he is the master of doing that. So that's his first strength. He comes in automatically doing a story that has genres that the audience worldwide loves. Now, I point out in my breakdown that this Avatar 2 is not nearly the same level as the first Avatar primarily because the first Avatar did something very powerful over the course of the story, which is it went from not only from a techno society to a nature society, the nature society winning, it what goes from male myth to female myth. This process cannot be repeated in Avatar 2. So what is the power of it? And, and by the way, another negative I mentioned is it goes way too long, way too long without conflict. And that comes from the basic premise of the story, which is because the bad guys have come back to our planet, I'm going to take my family and we're going to try to hide. We're going to disappear. We're going to go to this world of water, which means that the whole movie is a stall, right? We're not, we're not in conflict with these people until the very end. So what is it that is still so appealing? Well, the use of water as the new playground is, in my opinion, brilliant. 
and the way it's done is brilliant. Avatar is always about this concept to co- combine and grow, the basic idea of female myth. And what we see combining here is humans with the creatures of the sea, especially whales. That, at least to me, is extremely appealing. The other reason that I think it kicks it up to another level from what it would have been without this, which is the finale. Again, the key to any action story is the final battle. And the final battle here is fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, just as the final battle of Avatar 1 was fantastic. So if you're go- if one of your main genres is going to be action, you better have a great battle, and this one does. The same was true with Top Gun Maverick. Throughout the story, it's so full of cliches. It's laughable in many places. But the final battle is fantastic. And so you get what action brings us. Every genre has certain basic things that it does better than any other genre. And what action does better than any other genre is it inspires because we see the accomplishments, the physical feats that these characters are able to accomplish make us feel great. Again, Avatar, he's, there's nobody better than James Cameron at doing that. But you are working as a script doctor for Hollywood. When you see Avatar and the final scene, the, the fight, um, you see that Every water navy uh, are disappearing from the fight. We keep only the hero and the main enemy. Uh, what happens in your brain? Don't you s- say to yourself, oh, there is a massive plot hole here? I do. And at the same time, I say, I know exactly why they're doing it. And we see this in the first Avatar battle. What you want to do is you want to go from massive scope down to a, the end of the battle should be one-on-one always what you want to do because you get the benefit of the massive scope of the battle that is especially powerful in cinema, but then you get the emotional power of one-on-one fight. And that's why all great battles in the action form work that way. So this brings up the fundamental contradiction in all action stories, which is there is always a contradiction between what should happen emotionally and what should happen realistically in terms of plot. Action stories are notorious for having bad plot. First of all, not having enough plot, but second of all, having massive plot holes. And Avatar is no exception. In fact, you could say that it's even worse than many other action stories in that sense. The biggest problem I had, and I don't want to you know, ruin the ending for anybody, any of your listeners who haven't seen it yet, but there's another plot hole that happens at the end, which I realized had to be done in order to set up the next film, yet it was emotionally and realistically totally absurd. And that factors into my appreciation of it. As a viewer, I think, and as as a story doctor, I think, couldn't they have come up with some other way to do it besides that? But no, they couldn't. And so I, I just have to accept it and say, you know, the rest of it, many other parts of the rest of it were good enough that I can overlook that. Can you tell us what is the latest good story in sense of narrative of any genre that you have read, seen, or heard? The most recent, and you talked about the Oscar breakdown that I did, was The Woman King. This is a story that is very much in the category of an avatar, the Top Gun Maverick, in the sense that it is an action epic. Action epic is the transcendent form of the action genre. In this particular story, what was so impressive to me was that it plays out the rebirth of an African kingdom, but one that is not based on slavery. And that it means that it immediately kicks up the theme that you normally get in an action story tenfold. What it gives us is one of the rarest combinations that you get in popular storytelling today, which is a story that is highly plotted. Remember that importance of having a powerful plot? but also that has tremendous thematic power. This is something that Hollywood is largely incapable of doing at this point because all they do are these superhero movies, which tend to have, first of all, they don't have a whole lot of plot and they have very little theme because they're almost always savior story. But in this particular case, because the film focuses on the leader of African Amazons, it turns into a black and female empowerment origin story that has international scope. 
in terms of somebody who's all about story, what was appealing to me and what I was so impressed with, this is a story that loves plot and knows the power that plot has to express character development with emotional power. And this is contradictory to what we normally think of in, you know, art house films, highly Oscar nominated films, which tend to have zero plot and think that you get character change has more emotional power if you don't have plot. Exactly the opposite is the case. The more plot you have, the more emotional power the final character change will have. And Woman King showed this beautifully. And uh, what was the last time we were hooked by the promise of uh, a story or a pitch and were disappointed in the end? It's a film that just won the Oscar for Best Picture, which (laughs) is everything, everywhere, all at once. When I saw that movie, the first thing that entered my mind was Shakespeare's famous line, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And I don't want to be too hard on because I, what I did like about it was it's very ambitious. It's trying to do something new trying to do something we haven't seen before. But unfortunately, in my opinion, when you pull the curtain aside, you realize there's not a lot there. And there's, I think, certain really important structural reasons for that. First of all, it's a video game movie where the heroine is going to try to find different paths of escape in the multiverse. And what that means is that like video games, it is a multi-branching story. Now, multi-branching can do some really great things for you. But there is a huge cost, which is typically it lacks narrative drive. And that happens here. And that's made worse by the fact that these different paths that she takes are really the same beat. This is one of the cardinal sins of plot, hitting the same beat. And in this case, it's a series of fights that she has. And like superhero movies, these are superhero fights that have no consequences. They mean nothing. You know, Thor gets tossed, you know, through 10, you know, skyscraper buildings and shakes his head a little bit and gets back into the fight. Nobody's going to get hurt in these things. So the basic sequence of the story had very weak narrative drive. It didn't have development. It had repetition. And then what is the result? Well, somehow at the end, this meaningless repetition of fantasy fights has a positive effect on her that she solves her psychological problem and her problem with her daughter. Well, maybe she does. I don't know how. (laughs) I I, I certainly don't see how she's able to do that. It really just struck me as something that I talk about in the anatomy of story class, which is the common misconception about character change, what I call the light switch school of character change, where you just flip the switch in the final scene and somehow the character has changed and they've learned something. Well, it doesn't work that way. No, you have to do that through the plot. And they don't do that through the plot. It was a movie that I'd heard a lot of great things about going in, and that probably was part of the problem because my expectations were so high. But I think the execution was much lower than the ambition of the film. Let's talk about your career. Looking back, can you tell us about one thing that you are especially proud in your work? Well, I would say probably two things. The anatomy of story and the anatomy of genres. (laughs) And I'm not going to have any false modesty here. I believe that they are the two best books on story ever written. Obviously, other people will have to judge that, not me. But I certainly wrote both of them with that ambition. And I think each book does two very different things. You know, Anatomy of Story focuses very much on how do you write a great story. Anatomy of Genres takes it many steps further in ways that 10 years ago, I would not have predicted I could do that or that could be done in terms of exploring the deeper workings of story and how to write something great within the popular story world. Because this is the great challenge. There's so often there has been this dichotomy between, I want to write something that's really great versus I want to write something that's popular that people will read, people will see. Well, my belief is that You can do both and should do both at the same time. And what I tried to do in Anatomy of Genres is to give people the tools, both plot-wise and theme-wise, to allow them to do that. And it's the area of theme that is really so new. 
There is no book ever in the history of storytelling that talks that extensively with that much detail, with that much practical tools for how to express great theme through storytelling. You have given many writing advices in your career, whether it's in both your books or in all the masterclass and all the training that you give everywhere in the world. But what would you say the best writing advice you have ever received yourself? Well, you know, that was the biggest problem I faced in my career was that I didn't get any. It's partly because of when I started. I've been doing this for a lot of years. And when I started, there weren't any books on how do you tell story, especially in film. They just didn't exist. And so whatever advice I got at that time was either simplistic or wrong. And so I realized I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. I'm going to have to be self-taught here. What did I do? I basically took a page from Aristotle's book. Instead of starting with the theory and then trying to apply it to stories, what Aristotle did was he went to the plays, he went to the theater, he saw these different examples of drama. And then from that, he tried to expand it out to universal, to how does story work? So here's what I did. Every day, I would go to the local art house cinema where they would show two great films a day. And I sat in there for three years and I took notes in the dark. And I always sat on the left side in the aisle so that I could get the light from the screen. <laughs> the wind is blocked by somebody sitting in front of me and I get the light from the screen so I could read my notes. I could take notes. What I was looking for is what works and what doesn't. And that's when I realized it's all about structure and that it's all about deep structure. It's not these fake structure things like three act or hero's journey or save the cat. No, it's these deep structural beats in terms of what is the organic development of the character through the plot. This is where the whole game is won or lost. The ramifications of that is huge. First of all, it means that every story you tell, if you organically unfold that ma unique main character through those unique plot beats, you are going to have a story that no one else is telling. And that's how you set yourself apart from the crowd. That's how you say, I have a story brand. You have to pay me for that. It goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning, what I consider to be the single most important technique in all of the story, which is that plot must come from character. And if you do that, you are already ahead of 90% of everybody else writing today. And uh, we talked about other books. What is the book outside of yours that one must absolutely read to understand how to craft a good story? If there is any. Well, there is. There is. <laughs> There's a book by Northrop Fry called The Anatomy of Criticism. And my anatomy of story and anatomy of genres is partly a tip of the hat to his greatness. The Anatomy of Criticism is a very dense book. It's very philosophical. In many ways, it's tough to read. It is also one of the greatest books ever written, not just about story, about anything. The Anatomy of Criticism by Northrop Fry is absolutely must read. It was an interesting story about how I first encountered the ideas of it. I was a sophomore in high school. We had a first year teacher. And instead of following the proper curriculum, what he basically did was he, tr he translated Northrop Frye's Theory of the Hero, which is the first section of his book. Northrop Frye's Theory of the Hero, and he translated it and he made us understand how that worked in the stories that we were going to read that semester. My head just blew up because I realized, yes, that is how, not only is how stories work, That is some of the greatest knowledge that I've ever gained or ever will gain. So I can't recommend it strongly enough. And at the same time, I always give a caution. It's not easy reading, but if you really want to know a story, you've got to read that book. And who's the writer you admire above all who never disappoints you? Well, I'm going to have to go back a, a few decades, a few centuries on that one and go with Charles Dickens. In my mind... There is no one who is able to combine character with plot to create great characters, appealing characters, to weave an often very complex plot 
in the later years of the 19th century, we got started to move into anti-plot, where plot became a dirty word. To me, plot is the one, certainly one of the great joys, if not the great joy, of, of reading and watching stories. And so his ability to be great in both character and plot, and to be able to do that over so many books, and at the same time make tremendous strides and tremendous accomplishment in terms of expressing theme at the highest level, both politically, economically, as well as personally. I mean, I just don't know anyone, any author who's been able to put it together the way he did. And uh, as we are reaching the end of, uh, of our conversation, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what you talk about at the end of your book. In Anatomy of Genres, the last chapter is a very, very short chapter, and you devote this chapter on the future of storytelling. Uh, what are your thoughts on the new ways of experiencing stories that have emerged in the past few years, such as uh, virtual reality, interactive theater plays, or immersive video games that emphasize more on story, plot, and characters' choice but more than action and gameplay? Is there a brand new form of storytelling or genre that has recently caught your attention and maybe surprised you in a good way? Well, I'm so glad that you wanted to talk about that here because to me, the future of storytelling is fascinating. What we're moving toward, we're already partly there. And I think it's important to see the larger picture here of what's going on. In my opinion, it's a complete interconnection between life and story. And I believe that's a good thing because the more that story informs our lives, the more we can make a life that we want to live. And that's why in the, the final chapter in the future of storytelling, I talk about the future is going to be all genres all the time. What that is going to allow people to do is to, the reader can interact with the story at every level. And with all these different kinds of wisdom, because, you know, we talked earlier about the ladder of genres as we move from the lowest to the highest. But I also talk about in the final chapter, the fact that the real way to use story and the real way to use genres is as a kaleidoscope. In other words, to gain the wisdom of all the genres, use all of them. You need all of that wisdom to live a great life. This future of story, which is all genres all the time which implies what you just suggested in your question, immersion in these very interactive story mediums in which, depending on how you enter the story and how you coexist with the story, you can be dealing with it primarily as a fantasy or maybe as a love story or maybe as a detective story and so on and so forth. If that sounds really exciting. A lot of the stuff that's happening in the world is really exciting, but I would say For your listeners who are writers, it's important to understand that you can't just decide, I'm going to have a story with all the genres that's totally immersive and interactive and so on and so forth. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get story chaos. The first thing you have to know is to be able to do this kind of story, it has to be a story idea. It has to be a premise that can handle multiple genres, possibly up to all 14 of those genres. And there are very few story ideas that can. Maybe you can make an argument of Harry Potter or Game of Thrones. These are multi, multi-genre stories. And notice that they are series. In one case, it's a series of books and films. The other, it's a series of books and TV shows. It's got to be a huge canvas to allow you to have these various entry and exit points and interaction of this many genres going on at one time. But to me, what is the deeper value of that? The deeper value of that when story and life become totally interconnected is that story becomes the worldwide religion. And if I believe it already is, when I say religion, I don't mean that in a divisive way. I mean, it's a guide to how to live a good life regardless of the culture that you come from. In the final chapter, I call that the new poetics because it's really the poetics of life. And to me, that's a beautiful future, and I have never been more positive about the future of storytelling than I am today. <laughs> 
That is a beautiful way to end this conversation. We thank you again, John, for being with us today and talking about the genres you and your book and um, all the great things you've been teaching us. Thank you again, John. Thank you. My pleasure. It's been so great to be here with you and talk story. Thank you so much for inviting me. That concludes our show. We hope you had a good time with our guest, whom we greatly thank for spending time with us and being so kind. If you want to learn more about screenwriting and storytelling, we recommend that you read his books, Anatomy of Story and Anatomy of Genres. You can order your copies at truby.com and anatomyofgenres.com. You will find all the links in the description of this episode. You can also get the Blockbuster screenwriting software with all its add-ons linked to the genres that we talked about in this episode. If you speak French and this is your first time with us, we invite you to listen to our other episodes about writing and storytelling. You might make some great discoveries. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you enjoyed the show, please share it to the people you think might be interested And if you have a minute to spare, you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify to boost us up in the rankings. Any help from your part is greatly appreciated. Thanks for listening. Take care and see you soon. Au revoir. Au revoir.